out. Everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. Today, we're diving into another episode full of real-life horrors. Today, we're going to be looking at some of the worst disasters people have encountered while vacationing. Everybody goes on vacations or goes on trips at some point in their life. And the last thing that you expect when you travel to paradise or you travel to your favorite place across the globe is to run into your worst nightmare. Well, today we're going to be looking at some very harrowing stories here. But before we get into the episode, a few announcements. First of all, thank you to everybody who's placed an order for a Lights Out Skelly Plush. This is the limited edition Lights Out Plush that will only be around and available for purchase in the next two weeks. So you have less than two weeks to purchase it. It's through the link below. And so far, it's hit its goal. So that means everybody who's placed orders for sure going to get one. And I got to say, it's really cool. I designed it myself. And he's the official mascot of the Lights Out podcast. So pick one up. Why not? Get it for yourself. Get it for your kid. Get it for a friend. Just help support the show. Plus, it's just really cool. Also, merch is still available at milehighmerch.com. There's, uh, we restocked a lot of the sizes there. There was a lot of items that were out of stock. So if you haven't picked up your Lights Out merch yet, check it out. And lastly, always check out my CBD company, HireLoveWellness.com. You get 10% off with code Lights Out. We ship worldwide. But this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Babel, Hunt a Killer, and HelloFresh. And I am very eager to get into this episode. These stories, I think... Well, they're not really stories. This is real life. I think sometimes, especially with the paranormal, after a while, you're kind of like, oh, okay. You know, it's easy to build skepticism and be like, ah, oh, you know, I don't know if the paranormal is real. I don't know if these haunting stories or these possession stories are real. Well, today is 100% real. Everything in this episode is real life stories of people's worst experiences while vacationing. And I think there's just something so spooky about real life horrors like we saw with the amusement park disasters. I mean, it's just absolutely horrifying what can go wrong. And today we're going to look at what can go wrong while you're supposed to be relaxing. So first up, large objects falling out of nowhere and smashing into people sounds like the good old Looney Tunes cartoon, Wile E. Coyote. Love that growing up. But that's what led to the tragic end of several tourists in the French Alps trying to enjoy their vacation. On February 8, 2004, a slow rolling train traveled through the scenic region of southeastern France. It was a 93 mile ride from Nice to digne le bain and the train took a slow three hour trek through the countryside. Passengers were enjoying the snowy views out the windows in the dead of winter. Tall mountains stood on either side of the tracks and snow-covered trees covered the valleys in between. The passengers, you know, just enjoying themselves, taking in the romantic views. And they had no idea that a boulder the size of a car had just snapped off of the mountainside above them. It hurled down towards the train at incredible speeds. And within seconds after hearing the snap, the boulder smashed into the very first car of the train. The quiet ride was interrupted by what sounded like the explosion of twisted metal. The boulder completely obliterated the first car and sent the entire train off the tracks. Two passengers were crushed instantly, and nine others were injured. From the damage, the train couldn't go any further. So two rescue helicopters were dispatched to the scene of the accident, and they carried the injured and the rest of the passengers to the nearest town of Anat. Hours later, the train still dangled from the tracks, and the first car began to fill up with snow. Its nose was still crushed into the ground from the impact. Many of the passengers just wanted a nice vacation through the French Alps, but it was interrupted by a freak accident from the sky. And even though these tracks are known to get snow and rock falls pretty consistently, the region transport official said that even in winter, the track isn't usually dangerous. Unfortunately, the train was just at the wrong place at the wrong time, and it sadly cost two people their lives. Massive boulders falling from the sky might be one thing, but tiny bits of white snowflakes falling from the sky can be just as deadly in the mountains. Back in 2006, tech editor James Kim and his wife Kati 
and their two young daughters were on their way home from Portland, Oregon on the day after Thanksgiving. They had just spent the holiday with their family and they were on their way home heading for the southern coast. After they missed a turnoff, they followed what looked like a shortcut on their map. But really, the shortcut was a sketchy mountain road. They didn't know the area well, so they trusted their map navigation. And after driving for a bit, they noticed the road up ahead was blocked by snow and completely impassable. By that point, they were already in too deep. Their car got stuck when they tried backing it up. So they decided to spend the cold night in the car as the snow kept piling up around them. When they woke up the next morning, the entire car had been surrounded by deep snow. At this point, they were completely stranded, so they decided to turn on the car engine in order to keep warm. As hours passed, though, their car eventually ran out of gas, and no one had come to rescue them. So they burned a spare tire for heat, and they had no food and no water. So Kati decided to breastfeed her seven-month-old daughter, but also her four-year-old daughter. It was her only option to keep her children alive. Several days went by, and they started getting the feeling that no one was coming to rescue them. Their sources of heat were running out, and they had no water. So in a last-ditch effort, James decided to go look for help. Kati didn't want him to go, but he felt like he had no other choice. He was determined to save his family. He told his wife he would come back if he couldn't find a way out of the snow. And Kati watched as he faded away in the snowy forest. After nine days of being trapped in the car, local police and search parties still failed to find the vehicle. It wasn't until James' parents hired a helicopter squad to search the entire area that they finally found them. The helicopter pilot spotted the car stranded in the snow. And after finding a place to land, they rescued Kati and her daughters. But James was still out there, somewhere in the forest. As it turns out, James had fought against the impossible terrain and hiked several miles looking for help. He had trekked through a steep canyon and tried crossing a freezing creek. But this is where his journey ended. The temperature of the creek overpowered him. And his body was found floating in the creek several days later. What's worse is that if he only had walked in the other direction for a mile... He would have found an empty lodge filled with food and supplies. It seemed like he had run out of every last bit of luck. James's story is tragic, but he didn't go down without a fight. He fought through the snow and the train, while some investigators later called his test of strength superhuman. But sometimes man's strength is no match for the unforgiving winters of the mountains, and their story is a good example of why you shouldn't always trust your navigation map. It could lead you to dead ends. Despite the tragic end to that story, I think the flip side there is to if you're ever traveling through the mountains or even the desert or anywhere where you're not going to have cell service or nowhere to stop and get supplies, go prepared. Always bring enough food and water to at least last you for several days. A survival kit's even better. I know for me personally, living in Colorado, going into the mountains, I always make sure that I have enough supplies in order to last me for a week. And make sure you can build a fire to keep yourself warm. It's just crazy that one wrong turn can end in disaster, and it can happen to anyone. But the next vacation disaster might be in the back of every tourist's mind at one point or another. When traveling to a different country, most people think about where to eat or what clothes to bring. But when your destination is in the remote corners of the Sahara Desert, fear runs deeper than just worrying about how to order your food in English. On January 25th, 2009, an unnamed European tourist was attending a festival on the border between Mali and Niger in West Africa. The festival was for honoring the arts and customs of the Tuareg people. They are a nomadic tribe that live all across the Sahara. Their art ranges from jewelry made of silver, colored glass, and ceremonial swords. This region also happens to be one of the poorest areas in the world, and the Sahara Desert makes most of the area difficult to live in. Water is scarce, and so is advanced civilization. One of the tourists on the journey was an unnamed man from Luxembourg who came to soak up the culture in the beautiful, vast region of the Sahara. 
but his travels were about to take a turn for the worse. He piled into a car with four other tourists and headed across the desert. Two other tourist cars followed. They headed back to the tour offices in Niger. But their route was incredibly dangerous. Within minutes, a massive sandstorm kicked up and passed through the area. These storms are pretty common in the Sahara, but visibility dropped to a few dozen feet crossing through the desert, and the driver couldn't see very far, so they slowed down the car. Through the thick fog of sand, they heard another car engine in the distance. Slowly, another vehicle came into view through the wall of the storm. Inside it carried several Tuareg men armed with firearms and swords. Their faces and heads were covered, but turbans and sunglasses blocked their eyes. The driver of the tourist car tried to accelerate out of danger, but one of the Tuareg men aimed a rifle out of the window and shot out one of the tires of the tourist car. The driver tried to control the car the best he could as he swerved across the sand, and once the car came to a stop, the Tuareg men surrounded them, and they ordered the tourists to get out of the car at gunpoint. They screamed commands at the tourists which they couldn't understand, but it was clear they wanted them to get in the car. These Tuareg men were believed to be a part of a nationalist rebel group called Alliance for Change. Most of them were ex-soldiers from a 1990s rebellion in Mali. And by 2009, they scrambled across remote areas of the Sahara looking for violence. The hostages were the man from Luxembourg, two Swiss tourists, and a German. Meanwhile, their suitcases and most of their belongings were back in the tourist offices in Niger. In one of the other cars in the tour group was a man who ran the tour company. He watched through the sandstorm as the other tourists were taken hostage. Luckily, the tourist vehicle he was in was able to get away. The two Aregs only had enough band power to take over one of the three tour cars, so the other two sped through the sandstorm, heading back to the offices in Niger. The tourists who were taken hostage were never seen or heard from again. After the incident, officials from Mali and Niger began arguing over what side of the border the hostages were taken. The tour company owner said he was pretty sure they were in Mali, but in the middle of the desert, it's hard to know where the border is. It isn't marked. Plus, they were caught in the middle of a sandstorm. The border has been known for its violence as well as an easy place to smuggle drugs into Europe, and this wasn't the first time people had disappeared from this area. Just the year before, two Canadian diplomats entered the region and were never seen again. No one knows what happened to the hostages, but most assume the worst. All the tourists wanted was to absorb the arts and culture of the region, but their journey ended in a nightmare concealed by a sandstorm. So now, people that travel through this border region between Mali and Niger know that a sandstorm isn't even the scariest part of the Sahara. It's what hides within. This tragic story reminds me just how important it is to check with your embassy and the country that you're going to be traveling to. Not only should you check in with them, but also see if there's any security warnings because a lot of times they will outline regions of the country you're visiting that you probably shouldn't go to because there is an increased level and risk of violence or kidnapping there. But in this scenario, it really just seems like they were in the wrong place at the wrong time and that the sandstorm provided that window of opportunity for them to be kidnapped. Truly horrifying though, I can imagine. Most aren't lucky enough to tell their tale of being kidnapped like the hostages in the Sahara I just talked about. They're usually never heard from again. But in the case of Judith to Bud, she survived to tell her story. Judith and her husband David were a husband and wife from Britain. They had been married for 30 years and they had first met in Kenya all those decades ago. So for a nice vacation, they figured why not go back to where it all started. In September 2011, they spent a week on a safari in a Kenyan game reserve before heading to Kiwayu Beach Resort. The resort was on an island 25 miles from the coast of Somalia. The resort was beautiful, but Judith had a bad feeling from the very beginning. The whole place was quiet, no other guests were at the hotel besides Judith and David. While most would kill for a whole resort to themselves, Judith knew something was wrong. The room they stayed in was also really far away from the main building, so they were even isolated from most of the staff. Judith tried to be positive about it, and David joked about their situation. But by that first night, it became obvious why the resort was empty. 
After going to bed, Judith woke up to the sound of her husband struggling with someone in the dark. Then she saw the figure of her husband standing at the wall with his hands above his head. Then she felt someone jab in her stomach with the end of a rifle barrel. Hands wrapped around her, and before she knew it, they dragged her out of the hotel room and down the beach. Barefoot and still in her pajamas, they forced her into a small fishing boat and threw her on top of a stash of fuel canisters. And with no time to waste, they sped out to sea. Her husband was nowhere to be seen. Even from the earliest moments of terror, Judith figured she needed to take as much control over the situation as she could. She knew she needed to survive. Even though they made it clear she had been kidnapped for money, these were violent men. They weren't afraid to hit her or threaten to kill her if she didn't listen. So she used her knowledge of working in social work to try and get close to the pirates. She smiled at her captors and tried to engage with them as much as she could. Even though they had a language barrier between them, she tried to be friendly, and as time went on, she picked up the words please and thank you in Somali. She needed them to see her as a human being and not just a hostage or a bargaining chip. So she tried her best to form a connection with them. As weeks passed, she did everything she could to please them. One evening, they wanted her to wear a full hijab, so she agreed. And after putting it on, they made comments about how beautiful she was, now that she was a beautiful Somali woman. But Judith couldn't stand it. She wasn't a Somali woman, and she didn't want to lose her identity. So she removed it and got back into her old clothes. She was willing to form a connection with them, but she wasn't willing to lose herself in the process. As more time passed, they made it to land and kept her locked up in a hot, dirty room. There was only a single cot with mosquito netting, one table with a garden chair and several buckets on the floor for drinking water, bathing, and relieving herself. There were also two windows in the room, but metal shutters and grates blocked them off. The only sunlight came from a few breeze blocks above the doorway. Stuck in this room, Judith reminded herself to stay healthy. So she exercised every day. She walked around the room and also did Pilates. But even though she tried to stay in shape, the poor diet of rotten potatoes and rice made her weak as the months passed. She began losing weight and her mental strength began to fade. Still, she hadn't seen her husband, but she assumed he had made it. The last time she had seen him was in the hotel room with his hands above his head and all she could do was hold on to hope that he was still alive. That was the one thing that was keeping her going. As she remained locked in her room, her captors threatened her with execution several times, but she knew they needed her alive so they could make their money, and they were mostly poor young men looking for easy money. She assumed that they kept her husband alive for the same reason. One time when they threatened her, she suffered from a severe lack of sleep and she had a vision of vultures picking at her dead body. During her vision, she clawed at the ground in agony and realized that her fingers were burning. When she finally snapped out of her mental break, she realized she needed to keep her mind strong and not let go. During her captivity, she also thought of several ways to escape. One plan involved stealing a gun and mowing them all down. The other plan involved disguising herself in Somali clothes and sneaking away in the night, but nothing ever panned out. Luckily, when they had first arrived to the village, negotiations for her release began. She knew she was just a bargaining chip for money. After a few more weeks, she was able to talk to her son, Ollie. When she asked Ollie how David was, he had to break the news to her. And sadly, he told her that David didn't make it. David had died from his injuries not long after being attacked on the first night. He had tried to fight them off, but was eventually shot in the chest. And right as Judith wanted to get more information, the Somali pirate told her that her three-minute phone call was up. After they took the phone from her, sadness and anger overwhelmed her. She pointed at each one of the pirates in the room and accused them of murdering her husband. One by one, they quietly left the room as they watched her scream and cry in agony. Eventually, only the leader was left. She screamed in his face that he killed her husband until he also left the room in silence. And over the next several weeks, despair overwhelmed her. She began moaning, chanting and crying as she walked around her room. But her reactions brought out the worst in her captors. So she quickly realized she had to push her grief down if she wanted to survive. And in the meantime, she planned on building a case against the men to get revenge. Throughout her captivity, she tried to get as much evidence as she could. 
She made detailed descriptions about each of the men in her notebook and even tried to get their DNA evidence when they touched her torch or notebook. She hoped that one day they would be brought to justice. A few weeks later, they let her have a radio and she listened to the world news. And soon enough, after months of captivity and hostage negotiations, she was finally released in Nairobi. Her release had been negotiated with the help of her son in a private security firm. The amount they paid to release her is confidential, but she had been captive for nearly seven months and she lost 70 pounds during that time. She was covered in insect bites and bloody scratches all across her body, but she was glad to be alive. She was offered her old job back, but she refused. She wasn't sure if her nerves would hold up. She still tried to return to somewhat of a normal life, but she quickly realized nothing would ever be the same again. The Judith that existed before the kidnapping was gone, and her husband David was gone as well, and she struggled with the trauma. But she didn't want to let her captors win, so to this day she's been trying her best to move forward. And then in July 2013, a Kenyan court sentenced one of the resort hotel workers to death after convicting him of being in the gang that abducted Judith and killed her husband. It was discovered that he had led the men to the couple's room on the night of the abduction. Still, this didn't give Judith total closure. It was the only conviction this case would get. Her story now pays tribute to her husband David and her son Ollie, who helped negotiate her release. It's also a guide for anyone who needs to maintain their mental strength through a tough journey. Through everything, Judith tried her best to keep it together and stay strong and her journey shows us how quickly things can go wrong while on vacation. So for anyone who travels abroad and gets a funny feeling about where you're staying, it might be best to trust your gut and get out of there before it's too late. Such a crazy story and just, I know it's one of many out there of people that are kidnapped and held for ransom. Man, it's just so scary to think about. You know, you go to a resort to try to relax, and then before you know it, there's there's a bad apple working at the resort who's working with a gang or worse. And you're woken up in the middle of the night, abducted. And then you go on to live this horrible existence for the next seven months to find out that your husband's been killed. Man, just and just how strong Judith was. Like, it's just crazy to think about. Couldn't even imagine being in that position especially after you find out that your husband's been killed. It's a true story of strength. The next vacation disaster I'm going to look at has to do with wildlife. But before I get into that, I'm going to take a quick break here. Thank our sponsors and I'll be right back. As somebody who enjoys traveling, one thing I really regret is not taking more Spanish courses, not only in high school, but continuing that on until... I became fluent in Spanish because knowing a second language, I feel like is not only good just for your mind, but it's good for being a part of the world. But the good thing is, is that I'm here to tell you today that it's never too late to learn a new language. Thanks to Babbel. Babbel is the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, you can finally cross learning that new language off your list. With Babbel, you only need 10 minutes to complete a lesson, so you can start having real-life conversations in a new language in as little as three weeks, which is the most important part, especially when you're traveling. And that's what I used Babbel for when I went to Mexico last year. Took a bunch of courses through Babbel, and it allowed me to have simple conversations when I went to the gas station, things like that. It just made things a lot easier to be able to say simple phrases, ask questions for common things like bathroom, how much, you know, be able to actually understand how much money I needed to pay. Babbel really came in clutch. Other language learning apps use AI for their lessons plans, but Babbel lessons were created by over 150 language experts and voiced by real native speakers and not computers, which is really helpful. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. And with Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you improve your pronunciation and accent, which is great. And there are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, video stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. So start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash lights out. That's babbel.com slash lights out for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, 
language for life. And I want to thank HelloFresh for their continued support of the Lights Out podcast. I absolutely love HelloFresh. been using them for years. They just make it so much easier to plan out my meals for the week. With a baby and recording multiple podcasts every week, plus running my companies, I just don't have time to really think out a menu, go to the grocery store, get all the ingredients, cook it up. And then when I do do that, I end up making way too much food, both HelloFresh. They make it super easy. I just go into my HelloFresh account on the website or app. I can set all my meals for like a month or two out, literally set and forget it. And the meals just show right up to my door, all the ingredients pre-portioned, ready to go. I can whip up a home cooked delicious meal in like 30 minutes or less. And the cleanup is such an easy thing. I love it. And right now fall is the perfect time to cozy up with some delicious sweets. Get the whole family involved with HelloFresh's limited edition kid friendly baking kits, which is really cool. Plus HelloFresh isn't just for dinner. Shop HelloFresh market for quick breakfast, wholesome snacks, and even desserts. You'll find everything you need to satisfy your cravings without stepping foot in the grocery store or mini mart, which is really, really helpful. HelloFresh works with your schedule. Plans are flexible and you can change your meal preferences, update your delivery day, and even change your address with just a few taps on the HelloFresh app. And there's always something new on the menu, which I love. Their recipes are always changing from family friendly to fit and wholesome or even veggie recipes or something to please everyone. You can swap proteins. You can add proteins, remove proteins. It is the best meal kit out there. I can't tell you how much I love it enough. The produce has always been top notch, better than what I even get at the grocery store because it's literally like farm to table. The meats are all top quality. Never had an issue with it. So what are you doing? Go try out HelloFresh right now. Go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut16 and use code LightsOut16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. Go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut16 and use code LightsOut16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. So other worries that come from traveling across the world have to do less with hostage negotiations and more with the fear of dangerous wildlife. Many tourists leave their comfy suburbs of squirrels and raccoons and journey into parts of the world with much more bloodthirsty animals. That's to be expected in places like the Amazon or the Australian outback. But what happened to Dr. Kate Stone, even the most careful traveler couldn't predict her story. In early 2014, Kate traveled to the Scottish Highlands to visit her friends. This area is not known for having any predators. There aren't any bears, wolves, lions, or large carnivorous predators in Scotland. The region has diverse wildlife of friendly animals like outdoor cats, small birds, and deer. But Kate got to experience a much stranger side of Scotland. While enjoying a vacation with friends, she went to a late night party at the local inn. At the end of the night, a local musician invited Kate and her friends back to his place for a nightcap. When they got there, none of them noticed a large male deer had wandered into the garden next to his house. In the dark, they startled the deer with the noise they made while approaching the house. It bolted from the garden gate with a loud crash. And before Kate could even understand what was going on, she felt something smash into her throat. The deer had rammed its antlers into her neck at full speed. Another thud came as the deer knocked her to the ground. And after the deer frantically pulled its antlers out from her neck, it bolted into the dark. Kate lay there on the ground, slowly processing what had just happened, while her friends began screaming in horror as they saw the blood rushing from her throat. Kate reminded herself to breathe slowly and remain calm as she put pressure on the wound. When they finally got her to the hospital after 40 minutes, she was still alive. Doctors discovered that the antlers had punctured her windpipe and entered her spine. It tore through her trachea, esophagus, and vocal cords, and the antlers had stopped only two millimeters short of her spinal cord. If they had gone any further into the neck, she would have been paralyzed and possibly killed. The wound was so bad that they put her into a medically induced coma for seven weeks to treat her injuries, and after her long hospital stay, she could walk and talk again, but she still had to eat through a tube every day. Her tragic story shocked the locals, Attacks from deer were unheard of and basically never happened. So when they heard about Kate being nearly gored to death by a stag, the story sounded like an urban legend. Still, Kate doesn't regret a thing. The freak accident with the deer taught her to appreciate every moment in life because you never know when something like this can happen. Something as unlikely as being gored by a deer in a peaceful region with no dangerous wildlife. Because even the most docile animal can be deadly when they have a massive set of sharp antlers on their head. That's actually not the first story I've heard of somebody being gored by a stag or a large deer. But the next disaster deals with a more well-known predator that's also ruined plenty of vacations. 
The tragic story of 25-year-old Lauren Fela began when she met her boyfriend, Hito Chada, in February 2010. They lived in Los Angeles, and their romance grew over the next few months. By April, they wanted to travel together, so they decided to head to India, which was Hito's native country. As they got to the last leg of the trip, they ended up on Havelock Island. Here they decided to go snorkeling in the waters that were rich with wildlife. Maybe too rich. On April 28, 2010, Hito was out with his video camera as he snorkeled not far from Lorne. Suddenly, violent splashes of water flew up into the air near Lorne, and Hito immediately knew something was wrong. He dropped his camera and swam over to see a 12-foot crocodile attacking his girlfriend. Its powerful jaws clamped down on her leg as it dragged her into the water. Hito tried to reach for her, but he was too late. The massive creature whipped her into the dark water and they both vanished. After Hito reported the attack to police, they were suspicious at first. Crocodiles weren't known to be in the area where they had gone snorkeling. And since Hito and Lauren were boyfriend and girlfriend, there might have been foul play involved. It wasn't unheard of for a boyfriend to take his girlfriend out to a remote place across the world and murder her. But still, they decided to search for Lauren and the giant crocodile that took her. After a long search, her body was discovered two days later. She had died from drowning, and crocodile bite wounds covered her body. The crocodile had dragged her two miles east from the attack site, but they couldn't find the crocodile, which made the police even more suspicious of Hito. Plus, crocodiles usually attack at night, but saltwater crocodiles are known to be stealthy creatures who are often territorial, so Hito's story wasn't too far out there. They also recovered his video camera, which roughly showed what happened. The police then decided to hire a conservationist named Rom Whitaker to investigate the attack in the footage. And in the end, he had no reason to suspect Hito was lying. If anything, he had tried the best he could to save Lauren. And he would always regret that even his best attempt wasn't good enough to save her. Rom also noted that an attack like this was extremely unlikely. Even though crocodiles are known to be violent creatures, this attack was way outside their usual behavior and the animal was way outside its usual territory. The shore around the reef where they had snorkeled had no warning signs because crocodiles were never seen there before, but for whatever reason, that one massive crocodile decided to change territories and attack. After Lauren's death, Hito established the Lauren Elizabeth Fela Foundation in her memory. The nonprofit's goal is to help children and infants find love and living essentials. It also provides art therapy for kids. Lauren loved children and art, so Hito thought the foundation should focus on that. Another fun was started at the church where she sang choir growing up. And Lauren's tragic story goes to show that even violent predators can leave their normal territory to attack whenever they feel like it. So whenever you're exploring new areas in unknown places, it's best to be hyper aware of your surroundings, because danger lurks whether you suspect it or not. Saltwater crocodiles are scary, man. I just saw a video of a saltwater crocodile, I think was like, gosh, it was like on a beach in maybe Florida or something. I was like, oh my God. You know, when you're at the ocean or the beach snorkeling, you're always like in the back of your mind, you're like shark, 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 sharks, but it's not the sharks you even have to worry about. Saltwater crocodile. And saltwater crocodiles are big too. I mean, ah, it's just so horrible. So scary too. Always good to research where you're going to go snorkeling too, or go with the guide who knows the area very well because you just never know. But I mean, even in this case, it seems like there had never been a crocodile there before. So it just was bad luck, man. Just random bad luck. After hearing that story, you might think that coming across an angry 12 foot crocodile is one of the worst creatures you could ever cross paths with on vacation. But what if a creature smaller than a fly could cause as much terror? A 27-year-old British tourist named Rochelle Harris lived through her own personal nightmare after returning from a vacation in Peru in 2013. Soon after she got home, she began hearing faint scratching sounds coming from inside her head. At first, she thought, maybe I'm just going crazy and I'm just making up these sounds in my head. But along with the noise, she began experiencing mind-shattering headaches and shooting pains down the side of her face. She then noticed a thin white ooze that dripped slowly out of one ear. After this, she quickly went to see a doctor, and at first the doctor brushed it off as an ear infection. But after looking a bit closer, deep down her ear canal, the doctor saw something squirm. 
It looked like a white worm pulsing and shifting around in her ear. They sent a small camera down her ear canal where they saw a swarm of flesh-eating maggots wriggling around, eight in total. It was a larva from a fly known as a New World screwworm fly. It was a big insect known for seeking out pets, livestock, and wild animals as hosts, but occasionally they pick human ear canals to lay their larva. This insect has been successfully eliminated in the U.S., but they still plague Central and South America. And to make everything worse, they feed on dead and diseased flesh. The surgeons eventually extracted each maggot one by one. They slowly tweezed and pulled at the worms until they let go of her skin. And when they were done removing them, they called it a writhing mass of maggots. And they noticed a tiny hole had been chewed through her ear canal where they were feasting. This was a scratching noise that she had been hearing. The maggots were chewing a hole through her ear canal. Luckily, she didn't suffer any serious long-term damage, and she ended up with a bright outlook. After the disgusting ordeal was over, Rochelle said she was no longer squeamish about bugs. I mean, how can you be when you've had maggots living in your ear canal? Ugh, God, that just ugh, shivers down my spine just thinking about that. Ugh. That's like one of my worst fears is like a parasite or some type of nasty creature laying their larva inside my body. Ugh, it's just disgusting. Sometimes vacations can be ruined by just having too much fun. And you'll see why right after our last ad break. So this episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a mystery entertainment brand which produces immersive narrative mystery games, books, and other experiences available for purchase at retail and online at huntakiller.com. It's perfect for crime, mystery, and horror fans. Hunt a Killer has games in a variety of themes and realistic tones. Available in a range of prices and game styles, including standalone single-part mysteries, jigsaw puzzles, multi-part crime cases, and an exclusive monthly subscription membership. If you're tired of the same old game nights, definitely check out Hunt a Killer because you can play it with yourself, your friends, your family, and you get to be a detective. You get to sort through evidence, piece together clues, and solve the case with an immersive murder mystery game. Solve a murder, hunt a killer. Pick from the standalone single part crime cases, multi-chapter mystery boxes. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I think what makes this game so fun and unique is just how realistic and authentic the game is. I mean, the evidence that they give you to look at, the letters and all the things you get to review. The way that I like to think of Hunt a Killer is it's like if you used to play Clue as a kid, this is like the adult version of Clue, but it's super realistic. The cases are all really interesting and fun to solve. And it, it really does feel like you're actually solving a mystery, which is cool. Most recently, they sent me a new thrilling investigation that can be played in one sitting called Dead Below Deck. Here's why you should check out Dead Below Deck. One morning in the middle of a luxury cruise in the Caribbean, the charter William Bonnies wakes up hungover and makes a morning trip to the sauna. There he finds the body of Rachel Vainson, the yacht stewardess. Captain Javier Rackhams attends to the scene and initially declares the incident an accident. Nevertheless, he still diverts the course to the Bahamas where the official authorities look over the scene, coming to the same conclusion. So basically what you do is you use evidence to complete a timeline of the crime and eliminate suspects based on means, motive, and opportunity, discover the code to a locked tin, translate Morse code, interpret walkie-talkie codes, decipher a cryptic glyph language, and review maps of both the ocean and the yacht itself. Realistic evidence and documents guide players through a challenging and immersive experience with tons of twists and turns. Very, very interesting and a lot of fun to do with yourself, but it's even more fun to do with your friends and some drinks. Definitely a good time and it'll keep you busy for a good while. And lastly, what's cool about Hunt a Killer is that part of the proceeds go towards the Cold Case Foundation, an organization dedicated to solving real life cold cases. Plus, there's a spoiler free online community of over 100,000 members if players get stuck or want to chat about true crime. So check out Dead Below Deck or any of the other games from Hunt a Killer at huntakiller.com slash lights out and use code lights out for $10 off your purchase. So the strange and impulsive behavior of mother nature is definitely one way to ruin a vacation. A lot of tragedies in this list cover vacations that went horribly wrong in worst case scenarios, but some vacations have been ruined by having way too much fun. So much fun that it becomes lethal when two Canadian sisters, Audrey and Noemi Belanger, travel to Thailand for a good time. Their vacation ended way ahead of schedule. 
They had traveled to the PP Islands, famous for two things, beautiful beaches and endless parties filled with mystery drugs and alcohol. For my honeymoon, I actually went to Thailand and actually had the pleasure of visiting the PP Islands. And I will attest to this, it is a party place. I mean, you can party for days on end there. There's tons of drinks and for sure, lots of drugs. And the two young sisters, aged 20 and 26, went to the PP Islands ready to party. The bartender served them one of the strongest drinks around, locally known as the 4X100. Listen to what's in this 4x100 cocktail, it's crazy. So this hallucinogenic brew is made up of kratom tea, Coca-Cola, cough syrup, and a few other random drugs and substances thrown in. Can't even imagine what that would do to you. But eventually, the girls returned to their room after a wild night, and by the next day, others noticed that they hadn't come out of their room. Some just suspected that they were recovering from a bad hangover. But another day passed, and the maid knocked on the door to clean the room. And when no one answered, she unlocked the door and walked inside, and she found the sisters sprawled out on the beds. And they had tiny wounds all over their skin, and blood dripped from their gums. Both their fingernails and toenails were blue and had blood caked underneath them, and the entire room reeked of death and vomit that covered the floors and bed sheets. After the police showed up, they didn't find any evidence of a break-in or robbery, and they ruled out foul play. After some investigation, the autopsy revealed that they had most likely died from food poisoning, and it was discovered that one of the ingredients in the wild drink they had the night before might have been DEET, the active ingredient in bug spray. Why the fuck was that in this 4x100 cocktail? Well, your guess is as good as mine, but police also say they might have consumed it from somewhere else during the night. There was an incredible amount found in their bodies during the autopsy. They also found several over-the-counter drugs in their room. They were all mostly harmless, but if taken along with the mystery cocktail, that combination most likely gave them an intense reaction. And by the time they realized something was horribly wrong, it was all too late. So if there's one thing we can learn from this horrible story, never order the mysterious custom cocktail. Or yeah, oh, man, you don't want to end up like these two sisters. So sad. So sad. Very, very dangerous. Definitely don't want to mix drugs together ever. But the last vacation disaster I'm going to take a look at today doesn't deal with freak accidents, deadly mistakes by tourists, or hostage situations. But this one gruesome story deals with a huge mistake made by organized crime. In September 2010, the Mexican cartel gained an incredible amount of power and influence across North and Central America. While running international drug trades, they knew how to keep hold of their territories through gruesome acts of violence. They were known to execute people in horrific ways and wipe out rival gangs in the blink of an eye. In the seaport city of Acapulco, Mexico, 20 male tourists had traveled into the city looking for a place to stay. Many of them were relatives or friends. They worked as mechanics and saved up money each year to go on vacation. And on September 30th, 2010, they suddenly disappeared. With no trace left behind, they vanished from the city. This wasn't unheard of, especially if the men were connected to the drug cartels. But as far as authorities could tell, these men were simply on vacation, having a good time and minding their own business. They had no connection to the drug trade. But several weeks later, 18 of their bodies were discovered in a mass grave. Each one had been executed. Some had their heads removed and others were disemboweled. Two of the tourists were still missing and everything pointed to the cartel. And sure enough, it was. After authorities rested, a drug baron, Carlos Montemayor, a few weeks later, he came clean and admitted why the men were murdered. It was a lethal mistake. A faction of his gang mistook the male tourists for members of a rival gang. They forced them into vehicles, drove them out to the desert, and executed them. In the year before, Mexican Marines had killed a major cartel boss, and his death split two of the other barons into a civil war, and their bloodlust was so strong that they accidentally kidnapped and killed these tourists for no reason. From 2006 to 2010, more than 28,000 people had died from drug-related violence in Mexico, but now the violence had reached innocent tourists. The outrage hit a new high and two of the men were never found. So remember when you're planning a vacation, you might wanna to try to avoid places that have civil war, organized crime. Again, check the embassy websites because you just never know. And you wanna to try to be as safe as possible when you go on vacation because you wanna have a good time. 
You don't want to have to worry about your life being in jeopardy. You don't want to worry about the wildlife attacking you. You want to be able to go on vacation and just relax. That's the whole purpose of it. So my hope with these stories is that you can take something away from each and every one of them. Obviously, some are just wrong place, wrong time, bad luck. I mean, you can chalk it up to whatever you want. But some of these did have ways to prevent it from happening. So hopefully, you know, much like the amusement park episode, make sure the rides are safe. Make sure they're inspected. Don't ride the rides at fairs, for God's sake. Vacations. Be safe. Do your research. Check forums. Ask other people who have been there because it's so important that you go, especially to foreign countries or places you've never been before, armed with the knowledge that you need to be safe so that you can relax and have a good time. But that's where I'm going to end today's episode. There will be more future parts of worst vacation disasters because obviously there's tons more. So if you have any ideas of others I should cover, leave me a comment. You can also email me at lop at milehire.com. I have a suggestion form, I believe, in the description box as well, where you can leave a suggestion for a future story. But this has been part one of Real Life Horrors, Worst Vacation Disasters. With that being said, which one of these stories scared you the most? Maybe you have a similar story. Hopefully not. But let me know in the comments which one you found was the scariest to you, which one really hit you the hardest. But with that, I'm going to wrap up today's episode there. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Spotify, subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It does really help us out. Thank you to everybody who's left a review and rating for us as well. I do like to go and review those and and just get critiqued on the show and how I can possibly improve it more. Lastly, though, this is the last episode here in my basement. So happy to be back in the official Lights Out studio next week. So thank you guys for your patience during this time. But I will be back in my home base next week. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of Lights Out. And until next time, Lights Out, everybody.